the Iranian American Women's Foundation is one of my favorite events to speak at and to attend, actually, not just to speak at. And for a number of reasons. I think probably the most important reason is that I find it a very affirming event. Um, the energy in the room, which is very hard to quantify, is really um, beautiful. People are so kind, um, they're so curious, um, they're so interested in a positive way to find out uh, what are you doing, where are you going, where did you come from, uh, what informed the person you are today, uh, what is the narrative of your life, and how can it help uh, maybe um, inform my life? And, you know, I always say that I get more uh, from attending these conferences than I could ever hope to give. Uh, the first conference I went to was really a, a, a complete Valentine for me. Um, I, I went, I'm always anxious when I speak. I always take it as a very um, sacred obligation. I work very hard, I prepare, I, I want to uh, do my best. You know, 20 uh, some years of public speaking and it's still, uh, um, you know, not a, a, you know, a canned speech for me ever. I don't repeat them. Um, so I get nervous, I work at it, and uh, when I get to the place, I'm highly focused, where, whichever conference it is, and I'm very concerned to deliver something that is of value, and the people can walk away saying, we got something out of coming here today, or at least this half an hour or one hour uh, from this speaker. And Im almost immediately when I got up to speak, um, I could see from the faces of the people that they were um, open, they had not come to criticize, they had not come to find fault, um, and they were surprised uh, by what they were uh, receiving, uh, not just from me, but uh, from the entire event. Uh, so it's really one of my favorite, uh, favorite uh, events of the whole year. Uh, in terms of the camaraderie, the friendship, um, the information that's exchanged. I always uh, get to meet, uh, I think, uh, you know, you think you know everybody in the community, and of course, you know, you're invariably wrong uh, because you get to meet new people, and, uh, or you get to know the people you know better and their perspectives. Um, it's really a, a wonderful, wonderful event, uh, both to be in as a participant and to be in as a member of the audience. Um, and, you know, sometimes you're there and you see three generations. Uh, you see a grandmother, a mother, and a daughter, and they come up to you individually, and they talk to you, they know your mother, um, they know you, and they want to hear about what your daughter is doing. And you realize, you know, oceans have divided us from our homeland, but really nothing has divided us from each other. And so it, it, that's why I've wanted to support um, the effort from the very first day when Mariam came up with it, um, and she to she shared with me her ambitions and her thoughts about why it was important to gather the women in our community together and not just the, you know, sort of flashy CEOs or, uh, I, I, and not to say there's anything wrong, I'm a CEO and I think it's great, but um, not just the obvious ones, um, but maybe the jewels that are hidden uh, and other people don't get to see them as often. And so to see Najmi about Mongolij um, to see the um, other people that have special and unique gifts uh, that they bring, um, it's very, very special. You know, it's a question I'm asked often about my, my passions in life or my passion in life. Um, first and foremost, uh, my children. 
And uh, I have to tell you, I am not an intuitive mother. I find parenting extremely challenging. So while it is my passion, uh, my children are my love, the light of my eyes. Um, uh, I find parenting um, extraordinarily difficult. Um, and I have nothing but uh, the greatest respect for uh, the women and the men who sort of take like a duck to water. They seem to know instinctively what to do. I find the whole thing extremely puzzling. You know, it's, it's very difficult, very, very difficult. And around every corner, there seems to be a surprise. Uh, hopefully a good surprise, but nonetheless a surprise. And I'm a CEO. We generally don't like surprises. We want to be able to know, you know, we're control freaks. We want to know what comes next. Um, but in terms of uh, other passions of mine, besides uh, my children and my family, my brother, my sister, my parents, whom I'm so lucky to still have with, with us, um, and my passion, my extended family, my passion includes first and foremost my community, both in Minnesota and my extended community, the Iranian American family around uh, the United States and the Iranian diaspora around the world. Um, you know, I always say, you know, I left Iran on September the 17th, 1978, but Iran never left me. Um, you can take the girl out of the country. You can't take the country out of the girl. So um, as my mother said, my roots are deeply in that soil uh, where my ancestors are buried. Uh, while my branches grow in this beautiful country that has been an amazing uh, place of refuge for all of us. Um, so. Uh, my passion is uh, my community. Uh, my passion uh, is healthcare, which I find a fascinating field, a dynamic field, uh, where there is tons of innovation, both in technology as well as um, in um, pharmaceuticals, as well as in patient delivery, and of course in uh, the way we deliver health insurance. And one of the areas which I've been um, extremely passionate about, of course, has been marrying, uh, you know, healthcare with the community, and that's where the Foundation for the Children of Iran comes in, where I think we've been able to bring sort of the best of America, the best of American health care, uh, the best intentions of the Iranian American community in service to sick children in Iran who really have no options inside the country because their illness is very, very complicated and cannot be taken care of inside Iran. Actually, they have the types of illnesses that really can rarely be taken care of anywhere, even in the United States. They'd have to go to what we call centers of excellence. So I've been able to sort of marry uh, my passion about healthcare and innovation and cutting edge uh, technologies and patient care um, and uh, my community, both in Minnesota and the, the extended diaspora, in service of a nation that we really were forced to leave behind, not because we wanted to, uh, but because, you know, as, as we say, misfortune uh, took us down that path. So the Foundation for the Children of Iran has been one such outlet. And the other one, you know, frankly, has been um, a lot of these areas uh, around women's issues. You know, Madeleine Albright, uh, Secretary Albright, uh, has said something a while ago which has always stuck with me. Uh, she says, um, somewhat facetiously, but I guess it's very true, that there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. And I don't want to go to that place. <laughs> um, I want to go to the place in heaven that's reserved for women who um, reach out and elevate other women. So I think women's issues uh, in the United States and women's issues globally has been a, a passion of mine uh, because I think we have come a long, long way, uh, but we have a long way to go. And I am 
deeply saddened when I see uh, women um, undermining other women uh, because all around us uh, we see every day in so many ways strong, beautiful, powerful women being cut down for no reason, uh, for no reason at all, uh, deprived of their humanity and of their dignity. And then when you think that we have the chance to be, you know, sort of the wind beneath each other's wings, um, it's a shame. It's a shame. For me, feminism means believing in equality and democracy. So it's impossible for a woman not to be a feminist. And it's so important that my generation appreciate that we stand on the shoulders, as I said at the IAW conference in Washington, D.C., at Georgetown University, we stand on the shoulders of a generation of American women and of Iranian women who paved the way for us to get educated, for us to have rights, for us to be able to go out there and do what we wanted to do, what we wanted to do. And for the next generation, they need to know that they need to guard those rights. They need to guard those privileges. They need to guard those opportunities. That those are passed to them in a sacred trust. That they, are, they will be taken away, as they were from us back in our homeland, in a split second when we weren't being attentive as they will be here, as they will be elsewhere. You know, they always say to you, you can't turn the clock back. It's not true. It's not true. Laws can be undone. Case laws can be changed. We have seen in the course of our life that you can turn the clock back in the most insidious ways. So the next generation of women, what our generation of women got were choices. And what we tried to pass on were more choices for our daughters and for our children. And what we hope they will pass on is yet more choices. We are not even halfway there. So it is my hope that young women and the next generations and the next generations will just guard those choices, as I said, as though it has been passed to them in a sacred trust and not take any of it for granted and draw from our life lesson and continue the struggle until full equality is realized and becomes a matter of course and then guard it beyond that because your rights are yours to protect. They're not anything anyone will give to you and keep protecting for you. So about the business, let me just tell you um, quickly about the business. Um, I started our company in 1982. So actually in 2012, we completed 30 years of service, 30 years of business, um, which I know is impossible to believe because I'm barely 35. So I started in kindergarten. I'm going on record. Um, we were the nation's first preferred provider organization. The term PPO was coined for our company. Um, and uh, we're very, very proud of that. Uh, Health Easy uh, started the nation's first payment service uh, for consumers to pay their doctor bills online, automated, without having to open those weird envelopes and figure out what they owe the doctor. We had the nation's first statement, which looked like very much like a credit card statement, instead of the t traditional EOB, explanation of benefits, 
which I always say explains nothing and you don't feel like you got a benefit. So we took all of that and simplified it and reduced it to a credit card-like statement, which is the most familiar format to the American consumer. So I've spent my entire life, 30 years, trying to simplify the healthcare insurance size for American consumers and American doctors and hospitals even though I started my career in, in the United States as a hospital administrator and as a consultant uh, you know, to rural hospitals, small rural hospitals in Montana and Oregon and, and California, which at some point we should talk about because there's some funny things I can tell you about um, my life traveling through rural Montana in the early 1980s, um, which are quite amusing. But anyway, so uh, my background in business is, you know, I'm, you know, what people typically call a serial entrepreneur um, and, and an innovator. I actually see ideas fully formed. Um, and uh, it, it just comes to me. And the real challenge then becomes how do you oper operationalize these ideas? Uh, and how do you effectively scale them? And then the question is, what size is the right size? And that's a real challenge in healthcare, because I think that in healthcare you find a lot of companies, you know, and, and I'm a big uh, critic of this kind of approach. Uh, you know, everybody wants to be big, as though bigger is better, you know, and. Um, and that's what they teach you in business school and you know big companies are great and we all all we all worship at the altar of big um, I guess until we got to this point of too big to fail and we all sort of got giddy and dizzy but you know it's always good to grow to the right size and these healthcare companies that you call and they sort of say press one if you know, we think, if you think we can help you, press two if you think we care, are not the right size. There are some companies and some businesses that should remain at a scale that's human and relates to their customer. When I'm calling you about my child who's suffering from cancer, I don't want to go through a phone tree. I don't want an impersonal experience. I don't want to talk to an automated system and a computerized voice. So that's been really the big challenge is I don't want to be the biggest company in the United States. I want to be the best healthcare company in the United States. And I think we've been able to accomplish that. And honestly, all, everything we make we then deploy in our charitable endeavors. Whether it's the Foundation for the Children of Iran, you know, I'm on the board of the University of Minnesota Medical School, which is an extraordinary medical school with a brilliant track record and a brilliant future. And we pour our heart and souls into that. The business school at the University of Minnesota, Carlson Business School, Iranian American Women's Foundation, you know, all of these and more are causes that we are committed to. And, you know, we say you're not going to take it with you, and we live it. Uh, the very first person uh, who ever told me I was smart, I was 21 years old, and he was the Deputy Secretary of Health in Iran, and his name was Dr. Aram. And I don't know if he would be my first mentor or however you would, you know, classify it today, but he was the one that told me I'd gotten my, I had a postgraduate degree in international relations and I had, was planning to go back to Iran. I was done studying. And he was the one that said, you know, he'd graduated from the University of Minnesota in healthcare management, and he 
was in Iran and they were bringing universal, they wanted to bring universal healthcare coverage to Iran and have professional hospital managers and so on and so forth. And he said, why don't you go to the United States and study this? And I said, no, I don't want to do that. And he said, no, you should. And I said, no, I don't want to go to the United States. I don't want to study health care. And he said, no, you should go because, you know, the world of today is a European world. The world of tomorrow will be an American world. And you will regret not having an American education. And really, within a few months, he was in prison. Iran changed. Everything changed. But I tell you the story for two reasons. One is that he was the first person, and I always tell people this, because he was the first, I was 21 years old. I had graduated from the London School of Economics, from USC in international relations, before anybody told me I was smart. Like, why didn't anybody <laughs> tell me? It always makes me laugh. <laughs> why didn't anybody tell me sooner I was smart? You know, my daughter tells me, thank God they didn't tell you sooner. Can you imagine what you what you would be like if they had told you from when you were a little girl that you're a very smart girl. But I think it's very important that if you see in people whether they're smart or they're good at this or they're good at that, tell them that. Don't assume other people are telling them because there could be all kinds of talented people out there who don't know anything about it because nobody told them. Um, the other thing is that I think that it's important because he told me, you know, go out there and go see America. And I, you know, even though I had seen a lot of the world, just had no curiosity about the U.S. And of course, you know, how my life would have been different if I had not ha taken advantage of that opportunity or if that opportunity had not been suggested to me. So he was the first. And then when I came to the United States, um, uh, I, when I finished the program in healthcare management, you had to go do an internship. And there was a man by the name of Carl Plato. And out of 35 students in the master's program in healthcare management, he had the you know, prime internship, management internship at Fairview. And I applied to Fairview, and he picked me. So everybody before me were six foot and h taller, Norwegian, Scandinavian looking, you know, Americans and, and men. I was the first woman, I was the first non-Scandinavian, I was the first, uh, you know, first, 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 first. And I always wonder to this day what made him pick me. And he mentored me all the way through and he passed away in 2012 and he actually was the person who invited me to go on the board of the University of Minnesota uh, Medical School as well. So it was an enduring relationship um, for all these years and it was a very important relationship. But I have to tell you I have many mentors. Um, I have many relationships that inform who I am and what I am. I learn, um, I, you know, I learn from a lot of people around me um, every day in every way who support me and teach me and sustain me. Uh, it's not um, a one person um, or, um, or even a professional person. Um, there are many of these relationships that um, I draw strength and energy from, and I don't, you know, want to necessarily delve into each one of them. But um, I think that it's uh, really important not to limit yourself to thinking that only business people or only, um, you know, older people or only women or only this or only that. Um, you know, you can learn um, from all the people in your life in certain ways. As I said, you know, certainly parenting, I could uh, learn from all the people around me who are successful parents. Um, but as an example, you know, there's a lady who's uh, uh, done my uh, toenails for many years. And one day she told me when she was putting on one of these built-in shoes, 
after she did my toenails and she said, do you know Nazi, I thought of these shoes five years ago, but I didn't do anything about it. I bet the woman who did these is sitting on a beach somewhere having a drink right now. And you know what made me think, what that made me think of? There are no new ideas. A million people have the same idea. One person acts on it. That person becomes the innovator, the entrepreneur, maybe the Steve Jobs, maybe, you know, the successful business person. But it's not because their idea was new. It's because they acted on it. So I call that the Chris theory of business because Chris is the one who told me, hey, I had the same idea. I figured probably a million other people had the same idea. One person acted on it. The rest of them are still polishing nails. And she's right. That one person is probably sitting on a beach somewhere. I come from a very fortunate what used to be a very fortunate family um, back in the old days in Iran. Uh, my mother's family is from the ancient city of Yazd, uh, which I, you know is tens of thousands of years old, and where the religion, the Zoroastrian religion, which predates Islam, is from. And and I think it's very important for people to know that the Zoroastrians believe in the one unseen God and it predates Christianity, it predates the Abrahamic tradition, which most people in the West don't know. Um, so my mother's family comes from Yazd and we're very proud of that uh, background and that tradition. And my father's family are Turkish, Turkish Iranians, or as we call it, Turkey. So uh, very lucky. Uh, my grandparents were both, uh, my grandfathers were both very successful. My grandmothers were both very strong women, very willful women. On my grandmother's, uh, on my maternal grandmother's side, my mother's grandmother uh, would tell me a story uh, that her mother had had a dream that um, this legendary mythical monster all had come to her dream and threatened her and in her dream she had reached out and grabbed the necklace that all was wearing and ripped it off and that was a foretelling that there shall be seven generations of strong women. Now, I remember my, m this would be my mother's grandmother. I remember Khanum Jun very well, even though I was little when she passed. Uh, and I remember her telling the story um, and my grandmother repeating it and my mother repeating it and my aunts repeating it and I tell my daughter this story and I tell my nieces, my sister's daughter, two daughters this story. And the reason I'm telling you this story today is this is how much I believe in family and in tradition that you know, I do believe that my grandmother, uh, my great grandmother had this dream and I do believe that she put this in our heads so the women in our family would believe they are destined to be strong. They are destined to have an impact. And you know what? They have been through thick and thin, up and down, these women have believed it is their destiny to survive, to thrive, and to rise above all of this. So that is the family that I was born into. I was ed educated in Europe. I was sent away to boarding school when I was eight years old uh, to England. 
and um, subsequently I actually went back to Iran and um, I graduated high school at the age of 16 from um, Iran Zamin, the Tehran International School, which was a fabulous school. And we, there were students from everywhere in the world, including Israel and all the unlikely countries that you've ever heard of, um, that you can imagine. And, uh, and then from there on to, you know, Paris and London and the, you know, wonderful, eclectic, uh, international education and uh, until I landed in the United States and um, after coming to the US for my um, postgraduate studies I ended up um, meeting Andrew uh, my um, the father of my children and um, marrying him and Sam and Roz were born in Minnesota and uh, so here we are you know 34 years later, 34 years after September 17, 1978.